Hello and welcome back. So we have been discussing about different powder properties and so far we have learned about different characterization tools to characterize the powder in order to measure these properties. And in past few classes we have actually discussed about uh, two very important properties of uh, powder, the particle size and the surface area. Now there are few more properties which are as important as far as the powder metallurgy process is concerned. So in this lecture we are going to discuss about those properties. Interparticle friction is one of them. So let us first try and understand the importance of interparticle friction and then we will talk about how it is measured. See in a powder metallurgy process what happens is you start with a loose mass of powder and it is then consolidated to make a solid product out of it. Okay. So it is all about how the powder particles can be compacted to give it a particular shape you know to make that solid final product which you wanted. right? So therefore the packing of powder particles becomes very important in this powder metallurgy process and these packing characteristics of the powder are actually influenced by the interparticle friction right because packing means the powder particles have to come together and you know pack together to close the pores in between them and consolidate the powder and how closely the powder particles can be packed that obviously will depend on the friction between them right and that is why interparticle friction becomes so important in the powder metallurgy process and this uh, friction between the particles will depend obviously on the uh, surface characteristics for example the surface area the surface roughness and the surface chemistry. So these are the surface characteristics which will affect the interparticle friction. And as I said, the flow and packing characteristics of the powder are influenced by the interparticle friction. And as the surface roughness increases, the friction increases it is obvious and consequently the particles exhibit less efficient flow and packing right so if you have a powder where the particles have high interparticle friction then it might become difficult to pack them and the compaction process may be difficult right so the way it is measured is it is measured from this parameter called angle of repose uh, which is nothing but the angle which is formed in a heap of powder. So a heap of powder you might have seen around you for example uh, if you have seen a heap of sand or even a heap of the common cooking flour in the kitchen you would have seen how it forms a pyramid kind of thing right and the angle that it forms here that is an indication of the interparticle friction. So if we can measure this angle we can get an idea about the interparticle friction of a powder. So this angle of repose can be observed by tilting or rotating the powder to the angle when it flows naturally. So let's say you take some amount of powder uh, in some container and then you know keep tilting it unless the powder flows okay naturally out of the container. So that particular angle at which it is tilted when the powder starts flowing that can be taken as the angle of repose okay. And the flow rate is the measure of the powder feed rate through a small opening under gravity okay so if you want to know how the flow rate of the powder is because this is one 
property which also depends on the interparticle friction. So that can be measured by letting the powder flow through a small opening under gravity and the rate at which it flows through that small opening can be taken as the measure of the flow rate. If you have subsieve powders that will not flow due to high interparticle friction and such powders are termed as non-free flowing, right? So if the interparticle friction is high, which is the case for these subsieve powders, then it will prevent the powder to flow freely. And that is why this kind of powders are known as non-free flowing, okay? So if you have a powder on the other hand, which flows freely out of any container when it is being tilted or when it is being passed through a small opening, then that powder will be known as a free flowing powder. Okay, so that's the opposite scenario of this non free flowing, which is a typical characteristics of powders like this kind of subsieve powders or if you have other powder characteristics like the surface roughness or the irregular morphology which increase the interparticle friction that may also give rise to a non-free flowing kind of powder. So in order to measure this angle of repose what you need to know is the height of this heap or this pyramid which the powder makes without any agitation and this distance r okay so from that you will get this tan theta and you will get an idea about the angle of repose for any given powder now let us see how experimentally this interparticle friction can be measured or you know what is the measure of interparticle friction in what way it is reflected let us see that there are two parameters with regard to the powder when it is filled in any container one is the apparent density and the other is the tab density okay so these two parameters these two quantities are kind of the measure of interparticle friction okay so let us first understand what is apparent and tab density and then we will see how they can be measured and from that, as I said, an idea about the interparticle friction can be obtained. Apparent density is the density of a loose pack of powder without any agitation. Okay. So that means if you take any container and simply fill the container. So from that fill volume and the weight of the powder that is being filled, if you calculate the density, you know, without any movement or any agitation to the powder so that it does not settle down, that will give you the apparent density, okay. On the other hand, tab density, as the name itself suggests, is the maximum density achieved by vibration without applying external pressure. So here, you tap the powder or provide some vibration but without application of any external pressure okay so although some vibration is given for the powder particles to settle but there is no external pressure is applied and after that if you calculate the density from the volume and the mass then that will give you the tap density of the powder and the instrument which is used to measure this apparent density is known as the hall flow meter which can also measure the flow rate of coarser particles 
and for finer particles one more device called scott volumeter can be used and both these devices consist of a funnel and a volumetric cup in the scott device uh, baffles are used between the funnel and the cup uh, i'll show you the pictures of these in a moment and the flow rate is expressed as the time for 50 gram of powder to flow through the hall flow meter okay so that is how you can measure the flow rate of any given powder you have to see how much time 50 gram of that particular powder takes to flow through the hall flow meter and the apparent density of course is given by the weight of the powder and the volume of the cup okay so you fill the cup and you can see the volume of the cup because it's a volumetric cup so once the cup is filled you can see you can read the volume of the powder and the weight of the powder is measured and from that the apparent density can be obtained and the tap density is determined by vibrating the powder first for about 1000 to 3000 cycles at 284 cycles per minute so that is the kind of vibration rate which is used to vibrate the powder and once it is vibrated you know it will try and settle down so the volume in this case will reduce compared to the volume when you had it without any agitation that means when you calculate the apparent density that volume will be obviously higher than the tap volume or the volume after vibration so once the volume is calculated after vibrating the powder the weight is divided by that volume and the tap density is obtained okay now let us see these two devices as to how they look like so this is the hall flow meter here basically you have these two components one is this uh, feeding cup to feed the powder and the other is this volumetric cup that you have over here so this is uh, a cup you know uh, which is having some graduated scale on this from which you can read the volume of the powder which is being fed into the cup okay so this is the feeding funnel and this one is the volumetric cup and this is the scott volumeter in which apart from this uh, funnel you also have this baffle assembly here before the powder feeds into the cup in between the cup and the funnel there are baffles uh, this is to make sure that the powder flows and uh, this kind of uh, baffle assembly is particularly suitable for finer particles as we have talked about before so the main parts of this uh, uh, the scott volumeter are this the funnel and before that uh, a sieve is also provided then there is a loading funnel here to guide the powder towards the baffle assembly and this baffle assembly contains these uh, baffles 
which are made of glass. So the powder has to pass through these glass baffles before it comes down to the receiving cup at this end. Okay. So once the powder is received at the cup, the volume of the powder is noted and from the weight of the powder, the apparent density can be obtained and for the tap density, it has to be vibrated for a particular number of cycles at a particular vibration rate and after that, the volume is measured and from the weight, the density is obtained. Okay, so this is how the tap density and apparent density can be obtained from this kind of devices. And as I said in the beginning, these two are the parameters which are kind of the measure of interparticle friction. Now the other property of the powder that you need to look at as far as the compaction process is concerned is the compressibility. So as I said, the powder metallurgy process basically consists of compacting the powder into a particular shape and then consolidate and densify it to obtain the final product which should be fully dense, right? So how good is the compactibility that will be given by this property known as compressibility, okay? And this compressibility or compactibility is the measure of the ability of the powder to densify under an applied load, okay? So when you compact the powder, what is done is the powder is filled into a die and then a pressure is applied for the powder particles to pack together and give you what is known as a green compact, okay? So this is the shape which is finally densified by hitting it at a particular temperature when all these pores between the particles will be closed and a fully dense compact will come out, okay? So that heating process is known as sintering which is the another important component of the powder metallurgy process, right? So as I said, once the powder is compacted inside a die by applying a pressure, a solid compact comes out of it at the end of the compaction process and the density of that particular compact is known as the green density, okay? So this green density will kind of indicate how good is the compressibility or the compactibility of the powder. If the green density is high at the end of the compaction process, then we know that the powder is having good compactibility. Similarly, on the other hand, if it is low, if the green density is low, then we will know that the powder does not have good compressibility or compactibility, okay? For example, a compaction grade of iron or steel powder can achieve green density as high as 85 to 90 percent of the theoretical density, okay? So that is why this kind of iron and steel powder also go by this uh, name as the compaction grade because their compactibility is so good that just after compaction the density is 85 or 90 percent of the theoretical density that means only 10 to 15 percent porosity is remaining after the compaction process and another parameter which is used to get an idea about the compressibility is the compression ratio which is written as CR and it is given as the ratio of the volume of the loose powder and the volume of the compacted powder. Okay. 
so it is simply vl by vc where vl is the volume of the loose powder and vc is the volume of the compacted powder and this can be simply equated to rho g by rho a where rho g is the green density and rho a is the apparent density remember the weight of the powder remains the same before and after compaction so therefore the volume before compaction that is the volume of the loose powder vl will be given as the weight of the powder divided by the apparent density and similarly the volume of the compacted powder that is vc will be given as the weight of the powder divided by the green density rho g okay so if you take the ratio of vl and vc that will come out as rho g by rho a as i said before okay we are going to talk about more of this in our future lectures because green density is a important characteristics of the compact which will affect the centering process as well right so we need to talk about this in little more detail and we will do it as and when it comes up when we discuss about the compaction process and apart from this uh, external properties of the powder that we have been talking about so far like the internal friction the compressibility and so on which primarily depends on the external condition of the powder particle there are some uh, internal properties also which have a bearing on the properties of the powder particles and also on the compaction and the sintering process and all these properties can be grouped into one category of this powder structure and therefore the internal structure the structure of the internal structure of the powder is also important because it can reveal important information such as artifacts uh, related to processing conditions and possible problems if there are any in the powder which might you know lead to some problems during the powder metallurgy process so in order to reveal the uh, internal structure of the powder which is also known as the microstructure the powder has to be observed under a microscope and in order to do that the powder is first uh, mounted in epoxy resin polished etched and then observed under the microscope okay so this polishing and etching is to make sure that the uh, surface is ready to be observed under a microscope because if the surface is uh, not polished and not uh, shiny enough you know that is not uh, suitable for observation under a microscope okay and when scanning electron microscope or acm is used for observations it can also reveal information on nucleation sites contaminations grain size and segregation okay so such kind of information will not be available if you are using an optical microscope but scanning electron microscopes are quite capable of doing many other things apart from simply capturing the images 
and therefore this kind of information if somebody wants can be obtained by absorbing in an ACM. And then if there are any chances of uh, phase change, then that can be uh, evaluated by techniques like differential scanning calorimetry and it can also re reveal melting events. So that means uh, the powder will melt at what particular temperature that can be obtained by carrying out DSC experiments. And both of these are important because the powder compact has to be finally sintered at a particular temperature and that particular temperature has to be chosen uh, from this kind of analysis to ensure that during the heating process there is no phase change or no melting right otherwise uh, there will be problem in terms of either change in the properties of the powder or if there is melting then you know it's it is not only a change which is not desirable it can also be dangerous to the system because the molten metal can come out and spill over and so on therefore uh, this kind of information is quite useful while selecting the sintering temperature for a particular powder and then if you want to get information like contamination adsorbed moisture etc then a technique called thermogravimetric analysis can be used to provide such information. So this will tell you about the temperature at which the adsorbed moisture and other things which are physically or chemically adsorbed onto the surface of the powder particles can be removed. Okay. TGA basically is a technique which measures the weight loss as a function of temperature. So as you heat the material all this moisture and other things which are adsorbed onto the surface will slowly start evaporating at particular temperatures so till the time this evaporation or this uh, removal of the adsorbed uh, species happens the weight will continue to reduce and then there will be a temperature beyond which uh, it will show no reduction in the weight of the sample okay so that is how you will get to know that what is the temperature that the material has to be heated to in order to remove all the adsorbed species on the surface and that is also important because powder particles might have adsorbed moisture or even other uh, a species or contamination adsorbed on the surface and it is important to remove them before hitting the compact to the sintering temperature. And the chemistry of the powder will also have a lot of bearing on the properties of the material or the final product that you make out of the powder so in terms of the chemistry the powders can be divided into three groups elemental powder that is the pure powder without the presence of any secondary or any other metal then premixed powders which are used for making alloys for example a mixture of copper plus tin powders can be used for making bronze and then you will have pre-alloyed powder where the powder is already alloyed before the powder metallurgy process high purity is the major focus in the elemental powder whereas the impurity level and proper compounding are the main chemical concern for the pre-mixed powders Alloy composition and impurity content are the important factors in pre-alloyed powders because here we are talking about the presence of a second metal or even a third metal 
those which are known as the alloying elements and they have to be added in a particular amount to make an alloy and therefore their content becomes important in such pre-alloyed powders. Characterization tools to chemically characterize the powder include weight analysis, emission or flame spectroscopy, X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence or neutron activation. So there is a range of characterization tools which can be used to characterize the powder in terms of its chemistry. Inclusions may be present in uh, some powders, in some materials. And the concentration of uh, such inclusions can be estimated by acid dissolution. So in that case, what will happen is the metal will dissolve and the inclusion will remain back. It will not going to dissolve in the acid. So once you filter uh, the acid solution, this inclusion can be obtained and then you can measure their weight to get to know the concentration of these inclusions present in a, in a particular powder. And the surface oxide layers can be evaluated by reduction treatment. So when you reduce the uh, oxide by exposing it to a reducing gas from that kind of treatment, it is possible to get some idea about the oxide layers which may be present on the surface of powder particles. Powders uh, fabricated from melting techniques uh, provide greater opportunity for refining and hence can be expected to have high purity. Okay. So there are different fabrication routes that we have seen before and among those if there is melting involved for example the atomization technique that we talked about those kind of uh, techniques are better equipped to provide a higher purity compared to other processes right so before we uh, wind up this lecture let us take a moment to summarize it so today we talked about uh, some other important uh, properties of the powder such as the interparticle friction which has its own influence on the powder packing and the compaction process and this is something that can be obtained from the apparent density and the tap density apparent density is nothing but the density of a loose pack of powder without any agitation or vibration and tap density is the maximum density that can be achieved by vibration without applying any external pressure. So these two are the parameters which are kind of a measure of the interparticle friction and apparent density and tap density can be obtained by these two devices, the Hall flow meter and the Scott volumeter. Both of them basically consist of a funnel and a volumetric cup to measure the volume of the powder which is being fed and from that the density can be measured. So this is how these two devices look like. This is the Hall flow meter and this is the Scott volumeter. Then we talked about the compressibility or the compactability which is a very important property of powder because the powder has to be compacted in order to give it a shape and also how good the powder is in terms of its packing characteristics that can also be evaluated by the compressibility of the powder and green density is a very important parameter again as far as the compaction process is concerned. So this is the density which is obtained after the powder is compacted by applying an external pressure. Another parameter that can be used to measure compressibility is the compression ratio which is nothing but the ratio of the volume of loose powder and the compacted powder which is also equal to the ratio of green density to 
upper end density then we talked about the internal structure of the powder because the internal structure will also affect powder properties and this internal structure or the microstructure of the powder can be evaluated by observing it under a microscope and when scanning electron microscopes are used then it can also provide other information such as the nucleus and sites contaminations grain size segregation and so on and thermal analysis techniques like dsc and tga will provide information such as phase changes and melting events or presence of contamination or adds of moisture on the surface of the powder particles and finally we talked about the chemistry of the powder and in terms of the chemistry the powder can be divided into these three categories elemental powder premixed powder and pre alloyed powders and with that we come to the end of this class thank you for your attention